let's take a closer look at what's going on with ventilation. The idea of ventilation is getting air in and out of the lungs. Air moves to areas of lower pressure, like lots of things. Things like to go where they're less concentrated. Air moves to areas of lower pressure. If you have an area where the air is under high pressure, the air is going to move to an area where it's under lower pressure, like air going out of a balloon. The way we get air to move in and out of our lungs is by changing the pressure in our lungs. If we make the pressure in our lungs higher, that's going to make air want to go out into the lower pressure surrounding air. If we make the pressure in our lungs lower, that's going to draw air in since the lower pressure area is in our lungs. The way we change the pressure in our lungs is by changing the volume of our lungs. Because of Boyle's law, if we make the volume bigger, that makes the pressure go down. So imagine if I had a small box full of air, and then I put that air, the same amount of air, into a bigger box, it's going to be under less pressure. So I make my lungs bigger, the pressure in my lungs goes down. The low pressure in my lungs makes air move into my lungs. If, on the other hand, I make my lungs smaller, that's going to increase the pressure. Sort of like taking a big box of air and shoving all that air into a smaller box, it's going to be under higher pressure. So when I make my lungs smaller, that increases the pressure of the air inside my lungs and causes the air to flow out of my lungs. Let's take a closer look at how we breathe in. Now remember, in order to breathe in, I need to make my lungs bigger so that the pressure goes down and air flows in. Inspiration, inhalation, breathing in, is an active process. It's an active process because it requires energy, because muscles are going to contract. When I go to breathe in, a signal goes from my brain down the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve goes down to my diaphragm and causes the diaphragm to contract. When the diaphragm is relaxed, it's sort of dome-shaped. It's pushed up by my abdominal organs, so it's curved up uh, into the thoracic cavity. When the diaphragm contracts, it pulls down flat. That increases the size of the thoracic cavity, which lowers the pressure in the thoracic cavity. At the same time the signal is going down my phrenic nerve to the diaphragm, a signal is going down my intercostal nerves to my external intercostal muscles. If you remember the location of the intercostal muscles, they're found between the ribs. When my external intercostal muscles contract, they pull my ribs up and tip them out. So I pull the ribs up and out. That increases the volume of the thoracic cavity. That is going to lower the pressure further. When the pressure goes down, air flows into my lungs. As it comes in, it comes past all the mucous membranes. If I'm breathing in through my nose, it's going past my nasal conchae. So the air is warmed and moistened and filtered all on its way down into my lungs where it fills the alveoli, the air sacs of my lungs, where actual respiration or the exchange of gases can take place. Now this only works when my lungs and my thoracic cavity are intact. So let's think for a minute about what would happen if they weren't intact. So let's say I went running with a pair of scissors, even though my mother's told me a hundred times not to, and I fall and bam, stab them right between two of my ribs and poke a hole in my thoracic cavity. Now, when I go to breathe in, my diaphragm contracts and pulls down, my ribs pull up and out, but there's a hole in my thoracic cavity. So as I decrease the pressure in my thoracic cavity, instead of pulling air in through my mouth, I can pull air in through that hole in my body cavity wall. That's going to be pulling air into the thoracic cavity, but that air is not in my lungs. That air is around my lungs and can actually put pressure on the lungs and collapse them. That's called a pneumothorax, when there's air in the thoracic cavity and that collapses the lung and that makes it really hard to breathe. So let's say we get a nice breath in, we need to be able to breathe that breath back out. That's the process of exhalation or expiration is breathing out. Normal exhalation or expiration is a passive process. That means it doesn't require energy, and it doesn't require energy because muscles aren't contracting. When you breathe out normally, instead things are relaxing. The diaphragm relaxes and gets pushed back up into the thoracic cavity. That's going to decrease the volume of the thoracic cavity. 
The external intercostal muscles relax so the ribs tip in and come down and that decreases the volume of the thoracic cavity. And at the same time, there's a lot of elastic tissue, muscles and other elastic tissue in the thoracic uh, wall, and those tissues recoil back to their original size after they were stretched by the inhalation. All of those things decrease the volume of the thoracic cavity that increases the pressure of the air in the lungs and air flows out. It is important to note that we never completely empty our lungs. There's always some residual air in the alveoli, and this is important to keep those tiny little air sacs from collapsing. If your alveoli collapse, then it's harder for them to reopen due to surface tension. So we don't collapse our alveoli, and we also maintain air in our airways, like the trachea and the bronchi. We don't lose all of that air. We don't collapse the trachea. So there is air that remains in the respiratory system, even after we've breathed out as much as we can possibly breathe out. So that's what's going on with normal inhalation and normal exhalation. But we know we can breathe in more deeply if we try harder, and we can breathe out more air if we try harder. And those are referred to as forced ventilation, forced inspiration and forced expiration. And those use different muscles. Let's think for a minute about a forced inspiration. So I want you to take a second and take in a really deep breath and think about all the muscles that are working as you're breathing in as much as you can. Try it one more time and think again about the muscles that are contracting. When we do a forced inspiration, when we breathe in as deeply as we can, we're activating a number of muscles. We do contract the diaphragm, so the diaphragm pulls down. We do contract the external intercostal muscles, so the ribs come up and out. We also tend to contract a lot of muscles associated with the shoulders, pulling the shoulders up and back so that we're expanding the rib cage from that direction. Muscles like the pectoralis muscles, the sternocleidomastoid muscles, uh, these muscles all pull up on the ribs and back on the shoulders. In the back, our erector spiny muscles and trapezius muscles are involved in pulling the shoulders back and up so that we can expand our rib cage as much as possible. That way we increase the volume more, that decreases the pressure more, and more air comes in. When we want to breathe out more than a normal exhalation, that is an active process as well. If you're going to breathe out normally, that's passive. Muscles don't contract. When you're really trying to breathe out a lot, we contract a lot of muscles so it becomes an active process requiring energy. So again, I want you to take a moment, take in a deep breath, and then breathe out as much as you can. Just squeeze out all the air you can. Try it again. Can you feel any muscles contracting? Some of the main muscles involved include the internal intercostal muscles. Where your external intercostal muscles lift ribs up and out, the internal intercostal muscles pull them in and down to decrease the thoracic volume. We also get some contraction of muscles in the shoulders pulling the shoulders down and in. That's going to decrease the thoracic volume as well. Add to that the contraction of the abdominal muscles. So you should bend over a bit when you're trying to exhale as much as possible because your abdominal muscles are contracting, um, especially the rectus abdominis as well as the obliques. And the pelvic floor muscles also contract. So if you're really trying to breathe out hard, the pelvic muscles contract. The reason the pelvic and abdominal muscles contract is because that puts pressure on the abdominal organs and shoves them up toward the thoracic cavity. As we're shoving our abdominal organs up against the diaphragm and shoving that up into the thoracic cavity, we decrease the thoracic volume. That increases the pressure in the lungs and that's what causes you to breathe out even more air than you normally would. It's important to see how the pressure in the abdominal cavity affects what's going on with the lungs. But it's also important to see how what we do with our lungs affects our abdominal cavity. There's something called the Valsalva Maneuver. In the Valsalva Maneuver, you breathe in and hold your breath. So when you take a big breath in and hold it, that pulls the diaphragm down. That is putting pressure on your abdominal organs. 
we can use this maneuver to put pressure on the abdominal organs to try and push things out of the abdominal or pelvic cavity. We do this sometimes when we go to urinate. You take a breath in and then you squeeze down to help push the urine out. We do it when we defecate. So again, you go to the bathroom, you sit down, you take a breath in and hold it to put pressure on the abdominal organs so you can push the feces out. This is also important during vomiting. Have you ever noticed that right before you throw up, you take a breath in and then you throw up? That helps put pressure on the abdominal organs so you can force the contents of your stomach out more effectively. Finally, it's also really important during childbirth. If you've ever given birth, they may have told you while you were pushing to take in a deep breath and hold it while you push. That puts more pressure on the abdominal organs and allows you to put more pressure on the uterus to try and shove that baby out. These are all situations where it works pretty well, but there are some cases where the Valsalva maneuver can actually be pretty detrimental. Think about weightlifting. Have you ever lifted weights or had a trainer? What are you supposed to do as you lift the weight? As you're putting the pressure on and lifting the weight, what are you supposed to do with your breathing? You're supposed to breathe. They say, don't hold your breath. The best advice is to exhale as you lift so you're not holding your breath. The reason is that if you hold your breath as you lift, that held breath puts a lot of pressure on your abdominal organs and you're adding to that pressure by squeezing your core muscles while you lift and it can actually cause a hernia, which is a little loop of your intestine shoved out through an opening where it's not supposed to go.